And so when they die, even if they die at an old age, uh, as, as appropriately as possible, what we end up with is great sadness, anguish, we might call that. That's, that's a different word for great sadness because it's just more important. It's more important than Dr. Pepper. A loved one dying, especially at an early age, uh, or a pet or, or any, any sort of massive disappointment that has importance. You know, house catches fire. We've had fires ravaging California recently. Uh, as I record this podcast, it's December of 2018, and um, people are just now digging out of the, the wreckage of some major, major blazes. So there's massive, massive sadness along with that. And associated with that sadness, we can attach grief, and there's a process by which we go through grief. And I'm not going to get into that in this podcast. So if it sounds like I'm being very insensitive and I'm, and I'm invalidating people's experiences, that's not what I'm doing. What I'm doing is I'm explaining on a neurological level what sadness is trying to tell us. So if you experience one of those extreme tragedies, what we want to do is we want to acknowledge that simply an expectation was not met, and that's fine. We, we go through life all the time getting expectations not met and experiencing sadness. What my mission is is to try to get people to understand that these things are all fleeting and temporary. Now, some may be bigger than other, others, meaning that the amplitude of that wave, that three to nine seconds, can go from very high to very low based on the importance of the thing that we're experiencing. We want to embrace this fully, and we want to tolerate it, and we want to feel what life is throwing at us so that we live life fully. If we're not living life fully, we, we run into all sorts of problems. So we want to identify what it is that we're feeling. And, and, and often in, in different ways, our bodies will register this stuff that's, that's generated in our brains. So we learn how to interact appropriately with what's going on. And that's what Izzard discovered. Izzard discovered that uh, with, with almost like 94% accuracy, we can identify what someone is feeling by their facial presentation. So, And this crossed all cultures, all societies, uh, ages. We know that as long as somebody is expressing their emotion accurately upon their face, uh, 94% of people can tell what, what that is within those 10 emotions that I listed off in the first episode. So with sadness, we want to embrace it fully and we want to, we want to know what's going on and we want to tolerate it and we want to ride through that wave and know that the, the, the world won't stop turning simply because we had an emotional experience. We became vulnerable. We were exposed. We felt pain. It sucked. And life goes on. It doesn't stop there. And I think what ends up happening is, particularly with males uh, ra raised particularly in America or Western society, is that we get told that some of these more vulnerable emotions like uh, fear and shame and guilt and sadness are not to be felt. Um, and broadly, I think that, that Western society just sends that message to everybody, not just dudes, but but gals feel it too. And and you're just supposed to shut this down, put on a professional face, move forward as though it didn't happen. And that's that's fine and dandy. Like there are times and places uh, to, to stuff your emotion, but then we really need to reconnect with it later and really feel it fully so that the chemicals move through our bodies. We don't end up with weird physiological ailments because we've we've got – strange cortisol buildups in our muscle tissue and whatnot. Um, but ultimately, we want to feel what we feel so that we can act in an appropriate manner out of reason and logic and not out of the emotion. Sometimes what we do is we will act with a different emotion. And one of those emotions that we reach for that's not appropriate because it's not the appropriate thing that we're feeling is anger. Anger is said to motivate. So, for example, if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm pissed off every day at my job, I should probably go find new employment uh, to to alleviate what I'm angry about. Now, uh, that would be very odd for me because I own my own company. It'd be very strange if I were angry every day at work. I'd have to like fire myself or something. I don't, I don't know how that would work. But the idea is that anger is used to motivate. So, if we keep that in mind. And uh, you may be listening to this right now, struggling with some anger issues. And if you know that anger's purpose is to motivate, um, maybe ask yourself, why am I feeling this anger? And what am I motivated to do to make change, to go some, somewhere and do something about this? And if that's not possible, maybe it's not real 
legitimate anger. I mean, I'm not saying the anger is not legitimate, but it's not rational. It doesn't align. Possibly what's laying beneath the surface is something like sadness. It's a disappointment. So if you look at, say, the political landscape of our culture, not every decision that's made by a politician in in a situation of uh, or a position of influence is going to benefit you or your particular ideology or your your worldview or philosophy. That can be upsetting in a in a sadness way because your expectation is that they would represent you appropriately in their realm. And when they don't do that, you get disappointed. That's not anger. That's sadness. And you can tolerate that and you can ride through it. And I can imagine some of you saying, that's great, Jake. That sounds awesome. But what happens if the sadness keeps going and going and going? What do we do? Okay, two things. You can allow the anger to penetrate and it can motivate you to go make change. You can go down and you know write a series of letters to that representative to um, you know hear your voice and uh, make different decisions in the in the body in which they're they're elected or whatever. Or you can align your expectations with reality. If you know, for example, that your voice isn't going to be heard, somehow you have this information that, that they're not going to pay attention to you, let's say. Um, you can align your expectations with the reality that says, this person's not going to listen to me. So now my expectation is not that they're going to act on my behalf. They're going to act on the behalf of um, everybody else who doesn't think like me, who is in their district or whatever. Or maybe they have their own agenda or they're they're purchased by corporate interests or whatever, whatever we want to throw at them, right? But either way, that's... That's reality. And we don't need to headbutt reality trying to conform it to what we want it to be. We can simply align our expectations with reality so that we ourselves in our own worlds, walk in our own lives, aren't so thrown by this that we're constantly disappointed. If we go to the anger end, maybe that activates to go make change. Maybe we ourselves run for office to uh, supplant the person who's making these bad decisions on, on our behalf. And that's fine. That's appropriate anger. What's an example of inappropriate anger? Well, road rage. Road rage is an example of inappropriate anger or irrational anger, as I might call it, because if you're driving down the the highway at a high rate of speed and uh, a car cuts you off, you're not actually getting angry. What I would submit you're actually feeling is fear. And fear's job is to tell you that there's a threat or a danger present. And I'll cover fear in a different episode. But the point is that if you're feeling fear because uh, there's a legitimate threat to your life or safety and that of your passengers because a, a very heavy automobile just cut off your very heavy automobile at a high rate of speed, then why jump to anger? There's literally in that moment nothing you can change about it, whether you you know uh, flip the guy off in front of you or wave a pistol at him or chase him down off the highway and threaten to, to beat him up. That's not helpful. It's not going to change what just happened. What just happened was very scary, and if you learn that you can tolerate that fear, you don't have to jump to anger. So the anger in that moment overwhelms the, the frontal lobe, as all emotions do when we're in an emotional state, it overwhelms the frontal lobe, it clouds your cognition, it stymies your reasoning, and you don't act out of logic, you act out of emotion. And when you act out of emotion, we often, you know, you'll often do things that you regret. So um, we want to be mindful of when we're in an emotional state, label it accurately, tolerate it, or compartmentalize it and use it for later um, and then move on with the day so that we're not chasing people down off the highway and threatening them in their front yard while we, you know, miss our appointments and, um, you know, cause, cause a ripple effect through our lives that ultimately could have been avoided had, had we simply been able to tolerate the emotion lying underneath like a fear or a sadness. So let me give an example of somebody who's used anger to his advantage. Uh, there's a story about Tom Brady who was interviewed after his third Super Bowl victory in which he was asked, you know, how do you stay motivated after so much success? It seems like you would, you know, kind of coast and rest on your laurels and, you know, not, maybe not work so hard because uh, three Super Bowl victories is, is pretty impressive and not many people have done that. And uh, so goes the story that, that Tom Brady looked the interviewer in the eye and he says, you do realize I was drafted in the sixth round, right? So, so many years after his draft, the dude was still angry 
that he was passed over by 31 other teams six times until the Patriots picked him up. And he channeled that anger appropriately into making himself better. He It motivated him to study more film, to work harder in the weight room, watch his nutrition, uh, you know, learn more about the, the game and, and so forth. So that's an appropriate use of anger. Some, somewhat like using anger appropriately would be uh, to run for office to supplant the person who's making the bad decisions in the, the body to which they are elected. That's an appropriate use of anger. An inappropriate use of anger would be flaming others on social media. Um, attacking people who can't defend themselves, going home and, and becoming violent upon your family. That's not an appropriate use of anger. That doesn't motivate anything to, to make change to satisfy the disappointment that you're feeling or the fear that you're experiencing. So what we want to invite is we want to invite people to come back down and, and tolerate the, the more vulnerable emotions that they feel and then attack them in a different way so that they can act out of reason and logic. We're going to take a little break. I'm going to come back after the break and uh, explain a little bit deeper about how we can apply this in our everyday lives. Okay, we're back, and we're talking about sadness and anger and what to do with it. And I, I teased a little bit going into the break that we would uh, share how to use this in, in a way that's more practical in one's own life. So the first thing I want to share is that you have to learn what, where you feel what you feel in your body. So if you're feeling sadness in the pit of your stomach and you, you, you practice this a little bit and you have somebody validate it for you, you go, yeah, it sounds like it's sad, or you can validate yourself when you take a step back and go, why am I feeling what I'm feeling? Say you're one of those people who uh, jumps right to anger, or quote unquote, I should say, jumps right to anger. Yeah, you know, there is no, there is no range. I don't feel sadness. I'm, I'm always angry. Okay, well, I would invite you to analyze the events that that preceded that angry impulse or that angry experience, and pick it apart, and see the sequence of events in such a way that where one leads to the next, before you felt what you felt, did you have some expectations that were not met? Chances are really strong that most of people's anger comes from a disappointment or a sadness, not an actual anger that makes one want to change things. So that's one way of doing it is just simply to analyze. Notice when you're angry. This all starts with noticing, right? you got to build self-awareness to the point that you notice things. And then when you notice them, pull back and go, okay, how did I get here? What what transpired? Um, for example, the, the road rage incident, car cut me off. Um, I got angry, but Jake told me in that podcast that that's not an angry thing. That's a fear thing. Okay. Tolerate that fear, write it through. That's good. That's fine. That's well. Um, if you're angry at the fast food restaurant because they're out of Dr. Pepper, analyze it, go, what am I angry about? I'm angry that there's no Dr. Pepper. That's an opportunity to evaluate what's going on and say, am I actually angry or did I have an expectation not get met of my Dr. Pepper? As long as you can tolerate that and you go, well, you know, I'll just move my cup over to the, the Pepsi side and, and click on Pepsi and fill my cup with Pepsi and I can tolerate it. I can go on. Life will be fine. Then you can let it go and you don't have a stacking effect of disappointment. So you say you don't get the, the Dr. Pepper and you have to have Pepsi, but then you continue to think about it and then you chew on it and then you tell your friends about how they're, they're out of Dr. Pepper. You're keeping this dead moment in the past very much alive that's fueling that anger and you're choosing to be angry about it instead of choosing to be sad. And I, I use the word choice there very specifically and purposely because once we become aware of what we're feeling – you don't get to carry it on unless you choose to. Because like I said, the stimulus in the environment, the lack of Dr. Pepper, the car cutting you off, the, the loved one dying, those can only happen once. And then they're over. So it's not, again, it sounds very cruel and very insensitive that, I, that I'm suggesting that someone just simply move on from these incidents. But neurologically, that's exactly what happens. And the reason for that is that the next moment may demand your attention and it may demand more emotional energy that's not got anything to do with the previous moment. So if you're keeping these dead moments alive, what you're really doing is missing out on life as it presents itself to you. You, you go to the fast food restaurant, you end up settling for Pepsi, you go home, maybe the burger's cold, the manager was rude, whatever. You got all these stacking things going on in your, in your head and you're driving back to work, you're driving home and you're just thinking about it and you're chewing on it. Well, what you're missing out on is the traffic, the radio, uh, the possible um, scenery going by, 
And in so doing, if you're emotionally flooded and your your frontal lobe is not engaged, you could get into an accident, um, misinterpret a song lyric that may make you even angrier. Um, you may miss some scenery that was necessary to see because it's beautiful and it, it, you know you're working on being more at peace, but you you skip the flowers because you're so angry and you're just like gnawing on this Dr Pepper you didn't get. Um, all that stuff serves not only to take you out of the present moment and miss out on your own life. It could could, could cause real problems if you're distracted by emotional stuff in the car and you and you rear end the the car in front of you because you're not paying attention because you're so emotionally flooded. Now you got bigger problems. So we want to we want to tolerate these things moment by moment as the moments come to us and acknowledge them for what they are, wrap our arms around them, claim them as our own, and then let them go. <laughs> 